This is one of my favorite subjects to talk about of all times is hackney ponies. Uh, what, what comes to your mind when you think of a hackney pony? What gets your interest involved in, in owning or seeing a hackney pony show? We're going to talk about that. I might want some of your input, so think about that. And then what uh, families portray these characteristics that we like in a hackney pony? And that's what we're going to talk, uh, talk about tonight. I, uh, I have to talk about things that I got interested in. I can't cover everything. It would take us probably four or five days and evenings to cover all the breeds, uh, the ancestors of these breeds. But I'm going to pick out four foundation bloodlines that uh, portrays our hackney pony even up to today. And uh, so, Jay, you want to start out with, uh, with the first one? And we're going to talk about uh, a lot of these bloodlines and, and, uh, and certain things. So we're going to talk about foundation sires. We're going to talk about the families that produce where the great front end motion, the front delivery of the, the, out of the shoulder, the great front end motion. And what, what families over the years keep the hawk action going in the hackney pony? The hackney pony needs to drive off the back end. And... Uh, to have a good front end and a good, a good headset. And the families produce carriage and uh, the benefits of uh, line breeding. I'm a big, big believer in line breeding. And they did that way back in the teens, 19s, uh, 1920s, 1930s. There was a lot of line breeding going on. And we'll, we'll look at that also. And, uh, and then we'll look at some recent chap the champions that's in the show ring today and where their bloodlines trace back to these foundation sires. Uh, and then we got some little known stories, some trivial things we'll talk about. And then I want some input from you people, and you can correct me on anything that I might have mixed up on this, okay? So uh, let's go to the uh, Southward Swell. Uh, that, see, I've lived a long time, so this stuff might not interest you too much, but Southward Swell was a uh, stallion that uh, produced some really, really good bloodlines that uh, ca put characteristics of the show pony into, uh, into America. All right, uh, it's hard to find a pony, very difficult to find a pony that don't have south or swell in it. And uh, he was born in 1907, and he's bred by Enoch Stanky of uh, Warrington, England, and Mr. and Mrs. Willits imported uh, many of his daughters and sons to America and imported him also. Uh, we ha have to contribute a lot of success of the Hackney Pony in America to uh, the Willets, to Harley Heil, to Fred Dent, and a few others that saw they had the foresight to see to go to Europe and buy and import the best Hackney Ponies that they had. Now, a few years ago, Jay and I went to England, and we toured some Hackney Farms, and we, I know Lawrence Cars told me once that he went over there, and he couldn't find anything too much that could help us over here in America. We found the same thing. There were some nice ponies there, but not some really fantastic ones. They were small, more compact, but what uh, one of the early writers of Bill Simpson said that the best ponies were imported to America, and that's the reason today the best ponies are here in America. The best Hackney horses are in, in Europe. And uh, the reason that is, is I think, this is just my opinion, uh, as far as showing a, hack, uh, showing a horse in harness in America, we, we have the American Saddlebreds when they have the Morgans, and they are very high col quality show horses. In Europe, they don't have the Saddlebreds or the Morgans to the extent that we have, so they go on with the Hackney horses. And they do have some really nice Hackney horses. The Southward Swell line, one of the sons of Southward Swell that I think had a major impact on, uh, on our Hackney Pony today was uh, Castle's Masterpiece. And uh, he put up his bloodlines, and you see uh, he is by Southward Swell, and out of a uh, gentleman, uh, John Daughter, which was a great mare, and Masterpiece sired a lot of good ponies. He sired uh, Paddock Lane Dutch White, Pat Up Lane Stormmaster, Pat Up Lane uh, Raindrop, and we'll talk how they influenced our breed today. 
Well, and he sired also uh, through the bloodline of Fleetwood Strife. That's where this southward swell crossed well and got the Dutch white line, all the Dutch white line. And Dutch white uh, raindrop is a dam of old Tina Marie, uh, which is uh, the mother of Shamrock King, and we'll talk about that uh, later. Now, Castle's Valerie, that Southwest Valerie's really produced, she produced a lot of good ponies. She produced a daughter, Dunhaven's Valerie, by Mastercraft Magic Prince. And Dunhaven's Valerie, this is what's so interested in the Hackney bloodlines. Dunhaven's Valerie was a great producer of champions. I wrote an article, and it's right for the Hackney Journal, about uh, Dunhaven Valerie. And I forget how many champions she had, like six or eight champions at major shows by different studs. So uh, she is a double-bred Southward Swell. This is what you call line breeding. Masterpiece was by Southward Swell, and the Vera was also by Southward Swell. We do a lot of that this present day to enhance what we want. And, and uh, so here's where, and, oh, I wanted to say, mention this when I talk about Dunhaven Valerie. Dunhaven Valerie had no motion at all. I, and I bought her late in life. I raised Sky King out of her, and, um, and then I sold her to Marge Ferguson, and she raised Brass Lass. And that's out of Dunhaven's Valerie, which had no motion, but her offspring had tremendous motion, and it goes back to her dam side. And uh, you got to keep that in mind when you're breeding, that the direct offspring doesn't always come out what, the way you might want it to, but if the bloodlines are there, they'll produce it to next generation. And I found that to be true a lot in our breeding program. Uh, also with uh, uh, Dan Dunhaven Impression, a great horse. He's by uh, the uh, Shamrock King line also. And then uh, going further down the line, Gib Marcuse showed Triumphant King for a long time. I think uh, Denny Lang had him didn't he, too. And then, uh, and then Vindicator. Uh, Vindicator has a lot of southward swell in him. And uh, there you see through Debonair, and then you go back and you see back to where uh, Dutch White is, the Dutch White Souvenir and the Dainty Duchess of Paddock Lane. This is very important when you, that's line bred right there. Those, that family's line bred. And then you got the, all your Cacillus line here is, is very important. And then you come back and you, uh, we'll, we'll talk later about the Carnation King line in Jubilee. And uh, so Vindicator, has got southward swell on both sides of him. A few generations back, but we also see that the King of the Plains through Creation King and King of the Highlands and some of those really, really enhance southward swell's offspring. Okay. Mr. Amigo, he's another pony that uh, <laughs> I, I'll have to tell you a few personal stories on the way. I had a chance to buy Mr. Amigo when he's, Larry Bacon had him in California. He called me on the phone and he said, I got this pony, he's a Shetland pony, Shetland size Hackney. He said, would you be interested in having it? He said, it only cost you $500. And uh, I called David Deemer up and he had Shetlands. I said, you, you interested in going in half with him? No, I don't want to do it. He said, it cost $600 to get him and, and out here. I should have bought him. That's a, he's a good horse and he sired some good stuff. And he's got, he's by Debonair. I had a chance of buying Debonair at one time and that kind of fell through, and I made a mistake. I should have paid the money they wanted instead of what I was wanting to pay. And, uh, and then, of course, you go on your dam side. And we'll talk about the Mr. Yanks line, uh, line here later on in, the, in our presentation. The other line that I, not a lot of old Hackney people had a lot of respect for Irvington Autocrat. Some did, but Irvington Autocrat uh, had a big influence of developing the Wheatland Humdinger or the Humdinger line through uh, uh, Glen Evan Adore and Glen Evan Top Hat. So we'll talk a little bit about Irvington Autocrat. He's on the dam side of many champions in the past. A lot of uh, Irvington Autocrat bloodline. Uh, he was a very pretty horse. He had good motion, but some old timers, and I didn't see him. I didn't live that long, but anyway, um, said he didn't have a lot of guts, but I don't know. But he's in a lot of the top blood. Uh, Hackney ponies even of today. So we're going to look at the Irvington Autocrat line 
through Wheatland Sumdinger. Now I have to tell you a story. Uh, Gary Dunbar uh, was from Saskatchewan, Canada. He loved animals. He bred standard breads. He bred homing pigeons and other things. And he always seemed to go to the top in each of these uh, families of animals. And he went to the uh, Toronto Winter Fair one time and he was interested in, got interested in ponies. And he said, I just stood around, leaned against the wall and listened to pony people talk. And uh, he heard about these hackney ponies and he watched him and he fell in love with the hackney ponies. And that's what we need to talk about. What causes us to fall in love with hackney ponies? We'll talk about that after a while. And uh, anyway, he went back home and he knew there was a pony farm in Montana called Five Seas Pony Farm. And he went there to that farm, he and his father, and to buy some hackney ponies. And they had all kinds of hackney ponies and Shetlands and antelope. They all ran together. He told me he got, he got in the back of a stock truck. You know, a stock truck, the stock racks on it. And he and his dad got in the back of the stock rack and they drove around this open range in, in Montana looking at these ponies. And he kept seeing a certain group that had this tremendous trot. Big open trot ponies, not the prettiest in the world, but had tremendous trot. And that's one thing uh, I have, and Jay and I have talked a lot about, is the front end motion, the delivery of the front leg, and uh, so when he came down, he'd, he'd, he'd worked Humdinger up there and showed a little bit, and he brought him down to Dr. Ron's. He says, let's see if he do well in the States, uh, this hackney pony, Wheatland's Humdinger. So anyway, he brought him down, and when he came down here, why, uh, he was here all summer, so he'd come out and visit me and stay with Sandy and I for a few days, and we'd talk bloodlines. And he told me at that time, he said, when I ever get out of this, I want you to have my nucleus of my breeding. Well, finally he got out. That's one thing about Gary Dunbar. He goes real strong for a while and develop, get his accomplishments he want to accomplish, and then he does something different. So uh, John Foss, I don't know if anybody knows him or not. He was from Saskatchewan, Canada. He worked for Doc Ron for a while, while and then uh, I think worked in the insurance business in Kansas City before he passed away. He, he was at my place, and he loved ponies, and he says, you know, Gary's not doing anything with his ponies anymore. I said, well, he said I, I could have them. Yeah, I could buy him from him. He said, well, let's call him up. So we called him up, and he, Gary said, yes. He said, I told you he could. He said, uh, yeah. I said, well, will I be able to afford him? Yeah, you can afford him. Uh, but anyway, so I said, well, how can I get him? I'll bring him down. I'll herd him up and bring him down. He said, I got rid of a bunch of them to, up there, but I'll bring my, the basic bloodlines uh, that I got of uh, Wheatland Humdinger, and one mare especially was a result of the sire breeding his own mother. And that mare was uh, emotion, and her daughters, every one of her daughters, I don't know about, I think she's got four daughters, four or five daughters, and everyone has produced world champions for us. But that's a line bred family. So anyway, I kept, you know, the year went past, and I said, have you got those mares caught, those ponies caught? And he said, I can't catch them. He said, they're out in the open range. I can't catch them up here. And he said, I'll keep, I'll get him, so I'll get him. And I'd call him in three or four months later, and I haven't got him caught, haven't got him. It took me two years to get those ponies down here. So anyway, I'll talk about a little of that later. But anyway, as you, you notice right here, we talked about Irvington Autocrat over there, and then we got uh, uh, to, uh, Glen Avon Top Hat, which is by Irvington Autocrat down here. And then you've got also your other lines that has, has contributed. Delightful Delirium, we'll show a picture of Delightful Delirium after a while by King of the Plains, when they talk about King of the Plains line. And then you got your high, uh, King of the Highlands. King of the Highlands, a great sire, we'll talk about that. He sired Creation King and Cadet Commander. Two very important bloodlines that are breed today. Okay, that's, that's Glen Avon Top Hat. Glen Avon Top Hat had a full sister. And I can't remember uh, who, imported those two, but Glen Evans Door was the mother of Crystal Lady in Canada that won for years and years up there. And then the other one was Top Hat. He went to the West Coast and kind of got lost. Eventually got lost in Montana is what he did. And uh, so anyway, Irving and Autocrat line, we sold, I had, when I bought those mares from Gary Dunbar, there were six mares and the old stud. One mare was an ugly mare. 
uh, Junior and I was just talking about her tonight, but uh, she was by Humdinger, and uh, not a very pretty mare, and I bred her to Crescendo. And uh, I consigned her to one of Doc Ron's sales, and she had the colt before the sale, at about two weeks before the sale. And I remember Dad, to this day, Dad said, why are you selling that mare? Look at that colt. Well, that colt is Black Diamond. And Junior had tremendous success showing Black Diamond. I, one of my favorite. Look at the motion there. And that was, it was easy for him, wasn't it, Junior? Yeah. In that bloodline, that motion is there. You don't want to interfere with it. But anyway, that was a good, that was one of my favorite ponies. Okay, and of course, there's these bloodlines. <clears throat> and uh, crescendo here, and we'll go back to command the season. We'll go back to some he Cedar Heights breeding, uh, Stone Edge Juvenile breeding through Cedar Heights at, at later on. But, uh, and then over here, the mare was Keep the Face by uh, Humdinger. Humdinger was a person. Hey, I'm going to mention, I just saw this, Judy. Uh, <laughs> one time, uh, uh, Joe came to our place, it was on a Sunday afternoon. Gary Dunbar says, when you get Humdinger down there, he's 22 years old when he got to my place. He said, when you get down there, put a set of chains on him and just put a back pad on an open bridle and, and long line him. And I thought, why would I want to do that to a 22-year-old horse? Maybe we're going to stand over here. And but Joe came down. I don't know if he's coming through or what. And we was looking at it, and he hadn't seen Humdinger. He might have saw him show. I don't know. <clears throat> but anyway, I said... Let's put a back pad on. I had a snaffle bed, open bridle, and put a set of chains on him. And I turned him, I took him out there and long line him out there, and I dropped my jaw, and so did Joe. That horse trotted with his front leg almost, well, just like he does with the shoe on right there. Gary Dunbar showed him there. And uh, I am, as everybody knows, I am a really, really strong believer in Wheatland Sumdinger. Uh, Andy Freeceps got one of his uh, daughters, not direct daughters, but the bloodline there that he's been showing, sing a song. I should have brought a picture up of that one. That bloodline carries on for generations and generations and generations. Uh, not too many people know a lot about it. Uh, two people besides Dr. Ron that is high on Wheatland Humdinger blood is uh, uh, Skip Shanker and Bruce Kohnhauer because they worked up there during that time. And anyway, so now we need to also talk about and there is an autocrat that the uh, desirable characteristic of, <coughs> of attitudes and uh, desire to be a show pony, want to look like a show pony. Some ponies have <coughs> tremendous ability, but they don't really want to be a show pony. And they're hard to get through the ring and successfully. But here's uh, Troubadour. Uh, he uh, had a lot of presence about him. And uh, he's, he's uh, bred con all the way through basically southward swell line. Don't ever give up on old bloodlines. Get them through your breeding program some way, because it'll pay off. Uh, don't discard them at all. Okay, now Habworth Swell is another horse. Uh, about that time, he was born in 1919, and he came from uh, uh, England. Uh, he changed hands several times in England. I don't know what about those English people. They're never satisfied with what they have and go on with it. They're always selling and trading around and so forth. And he spent uh, 12 years, uh, or he's 12 years old and he came to America in, in 1930. He's empowered by Fred Dent. Now, Hebrew Swell is very, very important to our breed. And uh, he's a sire of Lavington Lucifer. Lucifer's daughters uh, cross very well with Creation King. Uh, Harley Heil and, and even Gene Kennedy used a lot of uh, Lavender and Lucifer daughters. So <clears throat> anyway, that's his bloodlines. Came from England. Uh, he's a son of Harborough Swell. There are several other sons. We'll go on to some other sons. So did Jupiter. <clears throat> One of my favorite studs, and you don't hear Hackney people talking about Stone Edge Jupiter. Lee Dunn and I talk about bloodlines an awful lot, and people tried to tell us and tried to convince people that Bandelier was by, had a saddlebred breeding in him, but Bandelier did not have any saddlebred breeding in him. He had Stone Edge Jupiter in him, and bloodlines of Stone Edge Jupiter comes a lot of carriage, a lot of necks, really beautiful necks. Little Swell is a very important horse. Some of these horses didn't get to use too much. Uh, Stone Edge Jupiter did not 
was not used near enough, and neither was Little Swell. Little Swell is a sire of Stone Age Little Abner, the sire of Mr. Sandman. And uh, tremendous, powerful, high-going, athletic showy animals, showy hackney ponies. And anyway, there's, I've just put on some of the studs. One is Coronation. Uh, he sired Double King. He sired a lot of show ponies, too. That's one son of, of Haberl Swell. His blood is, of course, by King of the Plains and out of a southward swell dam. You notice that a lot of these things are out of southward swell on the dam side. I tried, when I first got started studying these bloodlines, I tried to uh, put southward swell as much as I could on the mother's side onto a King of the Plain type breeding on the sire side. And it, it, there's a tendency that worked better that way. Delightful Dedarium is a pony that's in Humdinger's bloodlines. That is a beautiful stud by King of the Plains. And then there's the Little Bubbles. I remember Little Bubbles going through the Midwest Hackney sale when Callaway Hills had uh, a Hackney breeding farm along with their saddlebreds. And he was blind in one eye. He was, that, he was 20 some years old with that picture. And then there's uh, Highland Magic, uh, was a really good horse that didn't get to use, was not used as much as King of the Highlands. King of the Highlands was used better at his brother. So that's, you know, wouldn't you like to have them these horses today and then really worked on the, the breeding part? I would, I mean, that's, I just get all excited when I could. If I saw those characteristics, they pro propagated down the line. If we had known it then, as we do now, you know, we could maybe do a better job breeding. Okay, King of the Plains. King of the Plains is highly talked about for years and years and years. Now, I'm going to stop at this point and, and tell about why I, uh, some of the reasons I got interested in these ponies. First of all, <clears throat> my mother would tell me, even before I could talk, they'd go and driving in the country, I'd point out a horse, but I didn't point out a cow or sheep or nothing. I always point horses. And I supposed to, she said, I supposed to said that I'm going to own a, a million horses someday. But I, that's the reason that I was born with a tremendous desire to be around horses and work with horses. But I had no uh, way to do that because I was raised on a farm, and an 80-acre farm, and we had to raise cattle, hogs, and sheep, and chickens, and things like that. And Sandy was raised on, we was on the bottom of the hill, and she's raised on the top of the hill. And I remember first meeting her when she was in kindergarten. So anyway, anyway, there's a man. <clears throat> All right, I had a few pony, grade ponies, and my dad says, you know, if you're going to raise these ponies, you ought to raise registered ponies. So I thought, that's a good idea. You got support from my dad to raise registered ponies. So I took my ponies to Galesburg, Illinois, to a sale, grade ponies. And I mentioned there that I was going into registered hackney. So I'd bought one from, already I'd bought one registered hackney from uh, Roy Sutton at Kirksville, Missouri. That's Bill and Sonny Sutton's father. And uh, I knew not much, I didn't know anything about hackney ponies, but I liked the hackney ponies because I saw them at the Iowa State Fair when I was a kid. And they just, boy, took my eye, they were very athletic. So <clears throat> anyway, uh, I would go, after, I sold those ponies while Joe Coe came to me. He was the manager of the Marydale Farms. That's where Marydale Mr. Yank, Marydale Double King, a lot of the Marydale bloodlines uh, uh, came from. And he manages that farm for Dr. McClellan. And he, he hit me in the stalls. He says, I got some hackney ponies for sale if you're going to buy hackney ponies. Well, uh, I bought a son of Jubilee and a couple of Casilla Sincere mares from him, and uh, they weren't too good, none of them. <laughs> but anyway, it got me started. And we would go over, Sandy and I would go over from Burlington, Iowa, where we lived and taught school, to Galesburg, Illinois. It was about a 45-mile drive once a week. And we'd spend hours at John Coe's, uh, Don Coe's, Joe Coe's, Donzy son, home talking bloodlines, working through stud book after stud book, magazine after magazine, and what ponies are winning. And he had great stories. He's a great storyteller. We would spend maybe four or five hours once a week going over bloodlines at his place. Well, he got me on thinking and knowing some of these older bloodlines, and King of the Plains, of course, one of them. And he was a good friend of Reed Bridford, which is a trainer at uh, Dodge Stables. And there's just some pictures that took out of magazines of King of the Plains. You know, back in those days, 
They didn't work on the headsets to really crank them back like we do today. As long as their head was up and looking through the bridle, that's fine. But today, they would set up better if we trained them to do so. But that very athletic animal, King of the Plains. I remember one of the first years teaching in Burlington, and I would be 20, second year, 22, three years old. I was telling, talking to one of the maintenance workers that I had starting to get into hackney ponies. He says, you know King of the Plains? Here's a maintenance worker at a school district, new King of the Plains. Amazing. So uh, anyway, uh, King of the Plains is out of a southward swell mare and by Haberl swell. And that, that family works well. If you keep Southwest Swell strong on the dam side, King of the Plains through Cadet Commander, Creation King, uh, does well on the sire side. There's Highland Cora. That's a, that, one of the first ponies to beat uh, her sire, King of the Plains. Highland Cora uh, did beat uh, King of the Plains. You can see why, probably, from that picture. This, these are old pictures. And uh, so anyway, uh, there's Crystal Lady, uh, Mrs. Armstrong, up there in Canada had Crystal Lady. That's not a good picture, you know. These older pictures, they don't, the photography wasn't as good as they are today. And here we go with uh, one thing I want to point out again. Glen Evan uh, Adork, a full sister to Glen Evan Top Hat, was imported from Scotland to uh, North America. And Humdinger came from that line, Irvington Autocrat. We talked about him a little while ago, okay? I hope this isn't boring to you, but... Uh, it can get that way. <laughs> uh, in it. And then there's Highland Magic. Again, a really good horse. King of the Highlands. King of the Highlands had a big influence. I, uh, I was trained by Joe Coe that he was a very valuable horse. Uh, again, it's a southward swell. Probably made him a little stronger because he got it on the si dam side. Here's a Cadet Commander by King of the Highlands. King, uh, Cadet Commander, this family produced hawk action. You can see he's a little tighter with the front end motion. And all the pictures I could get, he's a little, he had high front end motion, but he's a little tighter with it. But he drove off the back end. He was a powerful going pony. And uh, we, the bloodline someone just mentioned about Dunhaven's awesome creation, uh, that all goes back to Cadet, Cadet Commander. And awesome creation had tremendous hawk action. And we have a, one of our breeding studs, uh, head of the class, Heartland head of the class, is out of a double bred Cadets and Joyce mare. And his, uh, his colts, when we work them in the barn, they have, they're automatically a little stronger in the back end than through some of the other studs. But uh, Doc Flannery showed uh, and had a commander. And then here's Creation King, and uh, Lyle Hartman's leading in the middle, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Heil Pony Farm in a little bit. That Lyle wrote a, a, a book uh, about the Heil Pony Farm. I don't know if anybody knows about it or not, but the Historical Society wanted Lyle to write the history of the Heil Pony Farm. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about that a little bit later. Okay, uh, but Creation King uh, is by King of the Highlands and again out of Southwest Swell Mare. And there's some of his offspring. If I had one stud today, I'd, well, there's several I'd like to have, but I'd sure like to have Creation King in, in, a, in a breeding program today. These are some of the offspring. I just took out some pictures out of magazines. He has many, many winners, Creation King. Uh, Creation Prince is one of my favorite studs. Uh, Gene Kennedy had uh, several really good studs. One is uh, King's Apollo, uh, Mayday Creation, uh, several others. But Creation Prince didn't get quite the recognition I thought he should have. He's a sire of Tijuana Brass. And there's Tijuana Brass and Bill Robson. Bill Robson found him at uh, uh, Maurice Locke's place down there at a uh, little town in Missouri. And uh, Maurice had trained him and showed him a couple times. And Bill Robinson is a real horseman. He can spot out a good animal, a good horse or whatever the breed it is. Creation Prince has uh, got southward swell on the dam side there, on the bottom side of the dam side, right along in here. That's the Creation King stuff, and of course it's King of the Plains all the way out. All right, let's go on. Uh, Director. Director's been a, a good breeding horse in our breed. He's by Coronation, and out of question, uh, a daughter of Questionnaire, which is by King of the Plains, 
and you got habro swell down here. It's just full of habro swell. You get these old bloodlines, you see habro swell and southward swell everywhere, intermingled with Irvington Autocrat. So that's the reason I brought <coughs> those families up. A little Gypsy was by, and that was a good pony that uh, I think Gibbs showed last for a long time. And then uh, here's a, one of my favorite pictures. I watched this pony show at the Waterloo Dairy Cattle Congress. They had a big uh, show up there for horses and ponies. Here is a son of a cadet commander that's shown barefooted. He had so much motion in front, they had to pull his shoes. They showed him barefooted with a shoe in the back. I watched him win a big class at the Iowa State Fair. Uh, Willard Elliott had him there at Cedar Rapids, Iowa. <clears throat> Iowa had a lot of good ponies at one time. Okay, uh, high tide is by cadet commander and out of King of the Plains mare. And then the Habro Swallow on the line of Mr. Sandman. One of the all time great show ponies. I remember we'd always take a, our summer vacation at the farm, the one week camp in a tent at the Iowa State Fairgrounds. And my mother, her favorite pony was Mr. Sandman, to watch Mr. Sandman show. And uh, Bill, Ro uh, Bill Robson loved that pony. He was a happy camper showing Mr. Sandman. You got some Southworth swell on there and some Irvington Autocrat back a ways. But uh, I should have got a picture. I did find it after I'd sent all these pictures. Stone Edge Lil Abner, great pony. Uh, Mrs. Lula Longcombs ended up with Stone Edge Lil Abner and raised several really top ponies. You know, reputation and ambition and and last edition, all by Stone Edge Lil Abner. Yankee Doodle is another son. King of the Plains line. Got Habro Swell and Southworth Swell on the damn side, Hathor Swell. I don't know where our American Hackney Pony would be today if we didn't have Habro Swell and Southworth Swell. I really don't know where we'd be today. And I don't know as people that's just getting into business realizes that. But they are uh, tremendous foundation sires. We got Mr. Yank, Mary Dale's Mr. Yank by Yankee Doodle. And he's uh, got the King of the Plains line, the Habro Swell line on the sire side. He's also got it on the dam side. And uh, there's a great mare, wasn't a real pretty mare. Uh, Mr. Yank's Poinsettia was raised at uh, Marydale Farms there at Lido, Illinois. And the Mrs. Uh, Pedersen had her for a while, had this mare for a while, and then went out to California. Oh, here's an interesting mare here. This is by uh, Cadets and Choice, Dunhaven Desiree. And I want to show you something on the dam side that's really interesting. Uh, Joe Cole, as I mentioned before, he kept in touch, even though Mary Dell Farm dispersed, he kept in touch with these Hackney ponies. And uh, he had uh, this mare, Jubilee's Dresden Doll by Jubilee, out of Mary Dell's Priceless by Castle Sincere, which is by Irvington Autocrat. Uh, Bob Clark, its own Jubilee Triumph, bred uh, Dresden Doll and got Jubilee's Triumph Doll. Jubilee's Triumph doll was a really, really pretty pony. I remember we had her at our place. We owned her. I, I got the mare and she had this colt. And uh, I was working as a three-year-old and I didn't know much about working these ponies, but this thing had so much ability. She trotted like King's Victorious, like trotting on eggs. And Lyle Hartman and his wife and uh, John Costello and his wife, they stopped on the way to Doc Ron's, no, on the way home from Doc Ron's, and they wanted to see this pony. Well, on the way before the sale, Lee Dunn had stopped, and he had to have this mare. So he bought Jubilee Triumph's doll from me, and therefore I bred her to Cadets of Choice. But when, when uh, Lyle Hartman and John Costello came after the sale, he said, I want that mare. I said, well, I just sold it to Lee Dunn. He says, you call him up and ask him whatever he's got to have, I'll give it to you. Lee wouldn't sell it. But anyway, that's a story of Desiree. And uh, then there's Mr. Pepper. He's out of the Stone Edge uh, Jupiter mare and by Mr. Yank. He was a hackney horse. He was big enough. He's all pony bred, but he was a hackney horse. And some of you, especially Rodney, would remember that uh, horse being shown a lot. Okay, on the Habro Swell line, we're going to go and talk a little bit about how that intermingled with the Stone Edge Jupiter. Well, it's a son. Uh, Herschel Cunningham at Paris, Illinois, <coughs> had uh, uh, Morocco, Morocco King's Mark, which is by King's Banner. 
and he had this Cedar Heights fascination mare, and every year, we started showing hand ponies back in those days, and every year when Herschel came in with that yearling, he'd always show a yearling, he came in and he won that class hands down. There were several full kin, and Lee Dunn saw this pony as a yearling, and he writes, uh, I, when they, somebody's interviewing him, uh, he said that he wasn't going to leave home without this pony. He looked like a saddlebred, long neck, and uh, he bought Command of Season from Herschel Cunningham at the Illinois State Fair. Uh, you see here that on the dam side, uh, you can see why I'm high on Stone Age Jupiter. You got Stone Age uh, Cedar Heights fascination. Cedar Heights Farm is at Cedar Rapids, Iowa. There, Stone Age Jupiter you got uh, Cedar Heights Ju Julia, and uh, out of a coronation daughter. And then you go back in here to the King of the Plains, Sunbow. Cuban Bow, King's Banner, Glen Avon, Cupid. That's all really good proven bloodlines. And then up here, we have the King of the Plains line up here, King of the Plains line right here. So he, uh, that's how he produced these ponies, and Herschel was an expert at showing these yearlings. And then uh, Mark Excellent is another line of Halbert's Well when you go through Creation King. And he's now passed away. I had a chance to buy, I read the pedigrees that Gene Kennedy sailed to, two different sales they had. And I always wanted to buy Apollo's Fashionette, the way it's bred. By King's Apollo, a King's High Fashion, which is really good mare. This is a full sister, I believe, to uh, the mother of Carnation King. So, uh, but the mare was not a good looking mare. And this is where I'm gonna bring out, I go more on bloodlines than I do an individual. It took years to convince me of this, but she wasn't a good looking mare and I turned her down two different sales. And then Rodney Root, I think, bought her and bred her to uh, uh, Mark Excellence and uh, Revelation's uh, son that Sally had and got that stud and he was really a good show horse and he became a really good sire. Okay, now we're gonna talk about a dam that I am <clears throat> convinced and been convinced over the years did uh, a lot for our breed. I did a tremendous for our breed. Joe Coe told me, and he told me the name back then, this is like seven, 60 years ago, the name of the person that sent an individual to Scotland to buy the best hackney pony mare that Europe had. And he went over there and came back with Fleetwood Strife. The only picture I know of Fleetwood Strife is he, she's 25 or 26 years old right there. <clears throat> That's at uh, Marydale Farm at Lido, Illinois. And she was foaled in 1932. In England, like I say, those English people, they just don't keep on to anything. They gotta sell them if they think they can make some money, I guess. Sold to Scotland, and then is imported by Carl H. Hanna, Cleveland, Ohio. And Hanna is the people that produced the Dutch White line, a pony. Now, if you're a study of the breed, Dutch White was another really great family. Dutch, Paddock Lane, Dutch White. His full brother, Paddock Lane Stormmaster, we'll talk a little bit about that, and Paddock Lane Raindrop is another full sister, <coughs> and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, in 1950, this mare was getting old, and she sold at Paris, Illinois, in a sale for $50. Um, her last foal was by Mary Dills Priceless at uh, 26 years of age. When she was in her 20s, she was bred to Creation King, and got Rusko's Black Ace. And that poor horse never had a chance in the breeding part. It's too bad, I'd love to have him. You can see he's a nice looking horse by Creation King and out of Fleetwood Strife, which is the dam of Inquisitive and Jubilee, the mother of Jubilee, and the dam of all those Dutch white ponies that uh, Mrs. Carl Hanna had. Inquisitive, I can tell you another story, uh, Glen of an Epic, was a stud that didn't have a whole lot of chance in America, and I don't know how good he was, but Bill Simpson said he was the highest going pony front and back he's ever seen. Okay, here's Paddock Lane Dutch White. You see the bloodlines there? Masterpiece on Fleetwood Strife was a great cross. It wasn't just one pony, but it was a number of ponies. So what people did is took those ponies with those bloodlines and interbred them and uh, to, we can even trace it back to pretty much present day, uh, some really good ponies. All right, this is Jubilee. This is a picture over there on the right is what you normally see. 
But on the left is a picture that <clears throat> Sandy and I and my mom and dad went up to Simon Mullets at Kelowna, Iowa about two, two weeks before he died in a fire, I believe it was. And one Sunday afternoon, and Simon Mullet, that Dean Mullet's father, which bought the pony uh, at Marydale Farms at their dispersal, I, he just let him out. He had a neck wrap off. I said, don't need to take it off. I just took it. Did he see what quality you had back then? That to the present day pony, to the featured stay in the day, Handsome Harry, a lot of it contributes back to this horse right here. And, and Carnation King and all that line. Okay. Inquisitive. All right. I'm just throwing up some pictures by Jubilee Sons. That's, uh, I like Jubilee's Ebony. Uh, he's a high going pony. I saw him show in hand. He couldn't beat him in hand, but uh, he kind of faded on the second way around the ring. Uh, Jubilee's Mr. Diefel is a nice looking pony. He was up in Michigan, I believe, for a while. And he's by a Mr. Yank daughter and goes back to little bubbles. It just, and then Jubilee's Beauty, I think, uh, oh, I forget who the last owner of Jubilee's Beauty was, but uh, that goes back into uh, Hawkeye breeding. And again, a Cadet Commander daughter was the last one. This is Jubilee Triumph. Now, the story of this one is <clears throat> my friend Bob Clark at uh, Coal Valley, Illinois, <clears throat> went, he loved hackney ponies. He's in construction. He worked uh, heavy equipment. He went to the sale and bought Triumph when she was really old, and she, her last colt was Jubilee's Triumph, and he loved that horse. He kept that horse at his place. Didn't do much. Oh, he had uh, Gene Carson train him, and that's Gene showing him there as a three or four year old. And then he just kept him his place. Uh, I bred. Uh, I had that Jubilee's Dread and the Doll bred to him, and different. He bred a few mares, um, but anyway. Uh, so when Bob's health got kind of bad, and he couldn't keep this livestock again, he gave the horse to me to use, Jubilee Triumph. <clears throat> and that's the reason Crystal Creek Commander is here today, is because Jubilee Triumph came to our farm. And uh, so you see Triumph, the mother of Cadet Commander, I mean the daughter of Cadet Commander, and uh, on Jubilee. And uh, he had another, I think Jubilee's Pico was a full brother. All right, go ahead, because the uh, Kentucky game is tonight, right, or is it? <laughs> All right, Carnation King. One of my favorite all-time ponies is Carnation King. Lyle Hartman, a true gentleman. I don't know how many people knew Lyle Hartman. He was a true, true gentleman. And uh, he and, the, and Iona Heil, they decided to breed the Carnation King daughter, of a King the Plain daughter, to Jubilee, and they got Carnation King. And I remember Lyle. Lyle would come over and visit me, stay, especially when Pressoff would come from California and visit four or five days, stay with us. He would come over and spend a day. And after he's there for a few hours, he started telling stories. And he, he's, he's a very humble man. And, uh, but he would tell how his daughter, when they went to, oh, I should back up a little bit. Uh, Mary and Oliver wanted him to breed that good mare to King of Belgium, so he didn't want to. He wanted to go back to uh, Jubilee, but Lyle said, okay, go ahead. And when they went to pick up the mare and colt down at uh, Mary and Oliver's here in Kentucky, his daughter was with him, and he says, Dad, how, what do you think of that colt? And Lyle says, if you got to know Lyle, he says, it'll do, it'll do. And uh, anyway, so uh, Carnation King sired a lot of winners. I think three or four years in a row, he sired every stake winner at Louisville through La Louisiane, Dream Boy, on the Amo. And uh, so Mary sent some of her pictures to Jay, so through Tom, uh, to show some of the Dream Boy is another son of, uh, of Carnation King and it did a a good job, a great job of showing, and a great job of, of uh, producing ponies. And we just throwed up a couple, three uh, Dream Boys offspring. Shamask was a, a winner. She showed Bill Bailey, another uh, son, and Master Bill. Carnation King, let's look at these bloodlines. We have, and we're going to go, I talked a little bit about Jubilee through Inquisitive and through Fleetwood Strife. This family line right here is strong. It propagates over and over and over if you add some of that blood back into it. And we'll talk about doing that. And then this mare, <coughs> it was a real pretty mare. I, 
<clears throat> Lyle Hart sent, when he's down in Costello, he said, sent this mare to our farm. He couldn't get her in fold. He said, Darrell, why don't you try to get her in fold? Uh, Lyle, Lyle Hartman is one of my really close friends. I have a lot of respect for him. And he tried to help me out as much as possible. But anyway, uh, King's Carnation H, it should be H on there for Heil, um, by Creation King and out of uh, a Highland Magic Mare by King of the Plains. And uh, here is another son of uh, Carnation King. This was born at uh, Costello's farm. He was a two-year-old when they had the dispersal down at uh, Tattersall's. He was Holiday's Mystery when they were sold, but uh, Mrs. Pretzoss changed, he bought him and changed his name to King Glen Levitt. <clears throat> the year that Lyle Hartman and Costello came to our farm, I think he came a couple different times, he saw another mare I had that I wanted to keep for breeding, and uh, it was this mare here, Banner's Love Light by Mod Models Banner Bright, that goes back to King's Banner, and out of a, a May Day Creation daughter, which goes back to that Jubilee's Dresden doll. Lyle's holding his pony out there at Mary Dell's farm in California. And Lyle told me, see, when we went out there, he uh, was starts to help uh, out there train a little bit in the wintertime. He's out there several months. And, and we would talk after everybody left. See, most people left soon after lunch. The work was done, I guess. I don't know. But we'd sit and talk. And he said, you know, this pony was as good as any Carnation King Pony I've ever worked, and he's worked some good ones. Remember King's Victorious? Anybody? I may remember King's Victorious. Man, what a pony. Anyway, he said, this is as good as anyone I've ever worked. But he says, as soon as the springtime come, I could not handle him. You know, he was a stud yet, and he couldn't handle him. So anyway, um, soon after that, Mrs. Pretzloff decided that she'd have to bring her breeding operation to our farm because uh, Matches Diamond got out and what got downtown Santa Barbara, California, and they didn't know how he was going to catch her, catch him. And so he just sent all the their breeding stock out to my farm. And uh, so I bred a mare that I got from uh, the guy at Iowa City, Sandy. Frank Boyd. Frank Boyd, Frank Boyd uh, he was a pretty good old guy, and he had some ponies, and, and he had this. Uh, mare that he said, uh, why don't you take it? I think he just gave the mare to me. He says, see what you can do with it. Well, I bred one, uh, one offspring she had by uh, Pizzazz. It was a decent pony. It went up to uh, uh, Minnesota. And then I bred her back to uh, Kings Glen Levin. And uh, uh, she didn't have any teeth. I'd have to feed her ground feed, and I, had, I didn't have the farm I got now. I had a small place in New London, small acreage. And uh, so I, I bred her and got her in fold to King's Glen Levitt, and, and uh, as we look at his bloodlines, I'll tell you how he's related to Vindicator. And I uh, called Gene Wilson up. I says, I got this mare. I don't have any room to keep her unless I keep her in the basement of the house, and I can't do that, and I got to feed her separate. I'm going to put her in a sale. And she bred similar to uh, Vindicator's mother. And so he went to the sale and bought her for $400. I tried to buy uh, Macmillan when he's three years old and he wanted 350000 So that's how smart I am. <laughs> but anyway, here's his bud lights. Uh, Sparkling Crystal is by Tijuana Brass, which I, they, I have a lot of respect for Tijuana Brass by Creations Prince, and out of Lockburn's Cupid Doll. Now, that, down here, the Lockbridge Cupid doll is the same bloodlines on the dam of Vindicator. And you know what? As we look at Handsome Harry and Handsome Dan and all that, he crossed well with Vindicator daughters. You got uh, Remington and Handsome Dan, full brothers. Out of the, it, so that, see how line breeding kind of contributes to the animal? But it's got to be the right type of animals we're line breeding, of course, you know. Okay, Mr. Hawkeye has it through Jubilee's Beauty. Uh, right there, Jubilee's Beauty. And I had a lot of respect for Mr. Hawkeye. He could really wear himself. And his sons, uh, Nabucco, it's just, he'd give you a thrill in the show ring. Gib did a great job with these ponies. And uh, this is, goes back to Revelation, the Jubilee, uh, Mr. Delightful, which you saw a picture of earlier. And, uh, 
Diamond's Brown Bomber was a great show pony. All right, now we're going to talk about breeding for motion. Now, <clears throat> what you have to help me here? What is attractive by a ha uh, what is attractive to people about the Hackney breed? Isn't it motion? Pardon? Yeah, motion and the athletic ability of this equine animal. Uh, I don't know any other breed. Now you'll have exceptions, you'll have some saddlebreds with tremendous athletic ability, some Morgans with chest back, but overall the Hackney uh, portrays the motion better than any breed that I know of. It's a harness breed. And it was originated and started in the 1300s and they bred them for road horses, trotting horses, uh, horses that go for uh, miles. In fact, they said in one article I read, that the hackneys would go 12 to 15 miles an hour. That's ironic, because I sold a pair of hackneys to some Amish people <coughs> in the middle part of the state down uh, uh, around Bloomfield. Uh, Mike would know the area. And, uh, and, I, and I was going to deliver some more. The next year, he wanted some more. And I had my trailer, and I followed him to the farm. I followed him for four or five miles, and, he, and I clocked him. That, those pair of hackney ponies pulling an Amish buggy was going 12 mile an hour. At the harness shop, I stopped, always, that's where I get my harness, and Mike knows where that is, <coughs> uh, work harness. And uh, all at once, there comes a guy in with a hackney pony that I'd sold a year or two earlier to him. And I said, where did he live? He said, he lives 20 miles from here. He drives that pony here and drives him back home in one day. These are hackney ponies. Hackney ponies are bred for endurance and uh, to hold up, their legs hold up well. It's an unbelievable breed. The hackney pony is an unbelievable breed. We need to sell it to the public better than what we're doing. It is a very unusual breed. Okay, where are we at? Okay, here, we go back to the Humdinger line. And I was taken, when I first saw Wheatland Humdinger, uh, I don't know if it was the first time or second time I was at the Illinois State Fair or the Midwest Charity, one of the two, it's at the Coliseum. And I was setting up with another guy that you would all know who it is, and I'm not going to say his name because I don't want to embarrass him. And uh, as Humdinger came in the ring, he said, wow. He says, Carnation King really looks good today. I said, that's not Carnation King, that's Wheatland's Humdinger. Okay, the old Wheatland Humdinger and then his son, produced high power out of a Jubilee Ebony daughter, and that son produced Heartland Victory on a mare. When I bred, Humdinger bred his own mother and got emotion. I bred emotion to high power and got victory. Then I used victory on a mare and got heartbreaker, and that, was, that mother was a dam of equality and I got Heartbreaker, and see how that motion carries on in that line, and it's all due, um, to some extent, it's due to line breeding the same bloodlines. If you got any questions, any comments, or contradictions, I, <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> I've been wrong a lot of times. Okay, for a long time, Shamrock King had the most open motion of anything I had until I saw Humdingers. There were two really open motion stallions, and uh, uh, Shamrock King line is, they just lay down and like to say it's like a little motor boat. You just shift back and just deliver that front leg way out there. And uh, so I tried to utilize those two lines to keep an open motion <coughs> trotting animal. We don't like these closed motion type animals no matter how pretty they are otherwise. It's just, that's not a hackney pony as far as I'm concerned. Uh, some common flaws and can, can be passed on if you're not careful. And I have one stud I got to be careful with, and that is uh, <clears throat> Heather Hartland, head of the class. He's double bred cadets and choice, and he uh, sometimes will wing a little bit. So he had, we had to address it when Rich was there, we had to address his winging. So that can be a fault that you don't want to have. So you have to breed that out. You can't intermingle, you know, breed. I wouldn't breed, in, inbreed that line together because I'd try to enhance the fault. We don't want to enhance faults, we want to enhance the good things. Oh, uh, one thing Lyle Hartman told me years ago, the motion is in the mouth. And I'm sure some of you trainers would say the same thing. Lyle Hartman was super with a mouth on a pony. When he'd drive a pony, I'd watch him, he just moved his fingers a little bit, working that bit, just his fingers. And that, 
He was, he was a great mouth, and that and all that emotion came about. Breeding for carriage, we're going back to the Stonehead Jupiter line crescendo. I got this uh, pony from Lee Dunn and traded half inches back to him, and I traded half inches back to Dave Deemer, and that's when I had just 17 acres. Now I got over 500 acres, but I didn't have room for all these things. And uh, so crescendo, I had got a lot of criticism for pony people having crescendo. They say, we don't want that in our breed. That's not a hackney pony. Now, granted, he didn't have the best front end motion. It wasn't bad, but he was injured when he was young, and therefore he didn't trot quite right. And uh, so anyway, I didn't know for sure which way to go with that. And then uh, uh, we see that comes from, I told you about Stone Age Jupiter, <clears throat> and not any, I never talked to anybody else except uh, Lee Dunn, we talked about it, but the only other person that's shown at Jupiter is where this carriage is coming from, predominantly, along with the, then your sweet Fleetwood Strife and stuff like that. Uh, so you see that uh, the Creation King family is known to wear their hawks well, they, they're, they're a good pony all the way around, and I suppose I better keep going a little faster, go ahead. <laughs> okay, um, one day Sandy was out, I don't know, was out in the yard or something, and, and Bandolier was running around, so she just took a snapshot with a picture of Bandolier just running outside. He was probably close to 20 years old at that time. And many of the ponies today have Bandolier blood. You can go through the bloodlines of the, the winners of ponies in the show ring. Somewhere there's some of that Bandolier blood for carriage. One thing we found out, the ponies sell to uh, maybe saddle horse people, other people that's attractive to carriage if you got more carriage in your ponies. Used to be shorter, coupled, compact ponies that trotted high, but uh, uh, Bandolier had a big influence. It wasn't me. Jay's the one that told me we need to get Bandolier, and he was going to the junior college, still staying at home. And Lee Dunn was there one day, and and uh, he called me at school. And he says, uh, "How about trading so and so and so and so for Bandolier?" And I said, "I don't know. He's low back. He's you know this and that and the other thing." And, he said, Jay said, we need that horse. And I said, well, do what you want to. So Jay made a deal with Lee Dunn, and we got Bandelier, but he, he had breeding rights to him. And again, we talked about earlier about the hawk action coming from the cadet commander line of Highland Magic. All right, go ahead. Uh, attitude and show ring presence. There's Revelation. I remember Revelation standing in Louisville in a lineup and never put an ear back, looking up in the st crowd, just looking around every time. He, he, uh, and a lot of that comes with Southworth Swell, expression and ears and everything. So that was a great pony. And Crystal Keat Amanda, I'm just putting these up to show you that there is the Bandler line and, and some of these good ponies. And there's the bloodlines of that. Here's a pony that did a lot of winning for uh, Randy Harper and uh, different people. And uh, it's got Cadets and uh, Choice as his sire. And Yankee Doodle's Melody. Uh, daughter is a dam. She produced, I, don't, I wrote an article about her years ago, she produced all kinds of winners, Yankee Doodle Melody, and last one was by strutting stuff that she had. And uh, I remember I went out, I was still teaching school, I went out doing my chores one morning and I had, I had loafing sheds with uh, gates in a little run, and she had her foot over uh, one of the gates into the hinge and had her front leg had broken there, so I had to put her down. We tried to save her, we took the leg off and tried to save her to have her colt, but she, we couldn't save her. Okay, someone mentioned they wanted me to talk about line breeding. I am a strong believer in line breeding. But there's a difference between line breeding and inbreeding. Inbreeding to me, and I don't know if I'm right or not, is like emotion was. She was a result of the mother bred to its sire. And, but line breeding is where you have on the sire side, like a grandsire of Haberswell, Quite two different places, and same with South was selling the south, dam side. That'd be line breeding. Um, line, uh, line breeding is a three-step uh, process. You identify the characteristics. We can't just line breed and be line breeding. We have to line breed the right stuff. As you all know, if you want, you know, you, what you want in the show ring, you want something that's a show pony, and it's got these characteristics. <clears throat> Uh, of a show pony, and there's a, we, there's a lot of other bloodlines, but so we try to line breed the good characteristics. You can line breed bad cashew and you can never get rid of it. It's, you gotta line breed the good characteristics. Determine what families have this. Now looky here, 
uh, there's Harborough Swell, and then you got Line Bread Dam, Southward Swell, Southward Swell, and you got Stone Edge Little Abner, and too bad Mrs. Uh, Little Longcombs didn't do more breeding or have more mares to breed to Stone Edge Little Abner. Uh, so that's line breeding. Okay, go ahead to the next one. And that's, that's a result of Stone Edge Little Abner. And then uh, on equality, what I did uh, is took uh, a mare that had a lot of athletic ability, no humdinger in it, had a lot of athletic ability through Shamrock King, Dunhaven Shamrock King right here, which Cyrus Sky King, and Impression, which is also by Shamrock King, and the dam is both Dunhaven Valerie right there and right there. That's line breeding. That was a very athletic mare. Jay worked the mare a little bit. We decided to definitely keep her as a breeding. We try to keep, for many years, and we still do to a certain extent, keep the best for breeding at our farm. Okay, and then on the sire side, this side here is all bred for carriage. Desdemona, I had a saddlebred guy came to my place years ago and he saw this mare in the pasture and it's Desdemona. And he says, man, what's that? He said, look at the neck on that thing. And he said, I wish I had my saddlebreds had neck like that. Well, that comes back to all this bloodline here. Command decision, you know where that comes from, Cedar Arts Fascination. And then you got your Dutch white breeding here, Dunhaven Sweet Success, I have a Dutch white mare. That's where the slanted eyes came from. This mare right here had slanted eyes. They tried to tell me there's a saddlebred he had, had saddled eyes. That's the reason he's, uh, Bandler's got saddlebred. It's, it's not true. But, uh, but this, this mare had slanted eyes. In fact, the owner for a while. And uh, Vern Houston up there had a daughter of hers by Tamblaine Commander he used for a while. Uh, that stud. Yeah, that, the, okay, yeah, Jay reminded me. We were, when we were in England, we had, a, we had an afternoon. We decided to go to the museum in London. And it's a huge, you, you couldn't see it in three days. But we happened to go up there, we saw these, uh, all kinds of uh, sculptures and, and uh, different things. And we, we went through this, went to this one, saw this case that had this sculpture of a horse. And we just looked at each other. It had this bandolier neck and it had slanted eyes. Sculptured 2,000 years before Christ. Amazing. I read an article on a professor that uh, studied uh, racing quarter horses, and uh, he said there's 16 billion combinations on a certain stallion, on a certain mare, before you go back to get an identical one. I don't know how I figured it out. He said there's 16 different. So that tells me in the Hackney equine breed, we got a lot of different combinations. And when one pops out, what I always do, if one pops out as a good animal, whether somebody has it in a show ring or I see it someplace, I look and see how it's bred and why is it like it is? Why is that animal that good? There's gotta be a reason. It just didn't happen. It had to be a reason. So, so normally you go back into the generations and say, well, you know, there was a really good one too with those same characteristics. That's when I went to try to get more of that bloodline and put uh, in, in together. So there's a, he's, equality is bred for carriage. Tremendous on the sire side for carriage. That Dunhaven Crystal had a really long neck. It was out of that Cedar Ice, Juna Mare, I was telling you, had a tremendous neck. You just don't let this stuff go by the wayside. Keep working on breeding this type of animal. What, you, what you're after, keep working at it. And uh, you'll see some, some results of it, okay. Uh, I'm going to tell you a few things. I told you about Gary Dunbar having uh, humdinger stuff, and I was supposed to get it. Finally, he got it caught, got it caught up. He called me after I, I'd hound him every other month, and he finally got him caught. First, I, never, I should finish what I told him. When he found him in, in, uh, in Montana on in open range, uh, Wheatland humdinger was two years old. And they got him back home. They couldn't catch him. They couldn't touch him. He was wild and they put him in a tin bin, you know, the grain bins, round grain bins, and they had the roof off of this grain bin, and they, they hoist down the grain and water with a rope. They couldn't get in the, in the bin with this pony. <coughs> and Gary's, Gary had a lot of patience, and so did his father. Excuse me. And uh, 
So his dad would sit in a little lot with him on a, on a bucket all day about with that horse to get that horse to be able to handle him. But anyway, that line is kind of tough. So when he got these ponies, he said, I'll bring them to you. I said, how you? He said, I, I can't catch them. I can't put halters on them. I can run them in a trailer. I said, how are you going to get the blood work done to get across the border? He says, I do a lot of hunting. He says, I hunt in Montana. He's a great hunter. He hunts everywhere. I don't know what he hunts, but he hunts. And uh, he says, I can cross an open range in Montana, and I'll get him there. And uh, he says, okay. Uh, he said, I got two I'm going to drop off to Doc Ron that I promised him. Paper met Patty that Skip had there for a while, and uh, Pepper met Twist or something. <clears throat> and so I said, well, I'll, uh, you going to bring him to my place? No, I'm going to bring him to Doc Ron's. I said, well, how, many is it, how much is this going to cost me? Because uh, we didn't have much money then, and <laughs> don't have much now either. But anyway, uh, uh, oh, you can afford it. You can afford it. You can afford it. So we came up, Cindy and I went up with our trailer and, and went there, and uh, he said, well, let's go out to eat lunch after we looked around. And, and uh, he says, uh, well, Doc Ron says, Humdinger's worth so much money, and Simplicity's worth so much money, and this one's worth so much money, and this one's worth so much money. He said, I've got to have at least $25,000 for the package, which is cheap, but I thought it was high priced then. And uh, I said, well, maybe you better let Doc Ron have them. And Sandy, you know, they're little redheads, you've got to watch those. She piped right up in her set and she said, we're going to take them. I said, well, I don't have the money. And, uh, and so I said to Gary, I said, you always want me to have them. I said, can you take half this month, or this year and half next year? He says, I'll do that. He says, I want you to have them. And uh, so that's how we bought them. We got them home, and I put them in, a, ran them in a stall in a barn, and I had to go up in the rafters and put a lariat around the mares and try to get them out. And I tied them into a feed bunk outside for over a month, and then I'd try to lead them to water and tie them up so he could handle them. And uh, this is a tough line of ponies. Uh, but the very first pony was out one of those tough mares, and uh, Jay and I got it broke. And uh, uh, what was the name of that pony? Well, Sally Wheeler had it for a while. You know it, Rodney. Uh, anyway, it's a tough pony, it's hard in the mouth. Classic. But, huh? Heartland Classic. Classic, Heartland Classic. Remember that? <laughs> tough pony. Doc had a special, Doc had a special bit for it to get it bent. Anyway, we got it in the ring at Illinois State Fair in a three-year-old class, I guess a three-year-old class, some cl young class anyway. And Gib Marcuse was in the ring and a few others, and we were winning the class. Skip Shanker was a judge. And, uh, and I just trying to keep the pony on its feet. And somebody came across the ring and ran into me. <laughs> I'm not gonna say who, but anyway, uh, and got him off his feet, and I was off his feet for half a lap, and so Skip calls the lineup right away, and so I just take the gate. Skip told me uh, after that show was over, he said, why did you take the gate? You was winning the class anyway. And I said, well, I was off my feet. I didn't think I could win that way. But I had three people that was in my stall by the time I got there at the pony to buy that pony. And uh, so it was sold for 50000 then, so that paid for that package that I bought. <laughs> that package is the best investment I ever He's ever made. Alive. Huh? He's still alive. Yeah, I got he bought about twenty. He's, right He's at your place. I showed him until he was twenty Wow. See that's it. The hackney can go forever. That's the reason it's hard to sell very many because they don't wear out. You know? And I told you how Wheatland Humdinger came across over in the United States. Uh, King the uh, Sky King, I uh, I always loved the Valerie line, Dunham and Valerie, and I tried to buy Dunham and Valerie from Lee for lots of the years and couldn't get the job done. And I said, well, you know, if you ever want to sell her, I'll buy her. Well, she is 21 years old when I got her bought, I think, and, she, and Lee says she's not in full. And before that, I said, I want to breed the Shamrock King, which he didn't stand his stead, but I said, you ever need money, I'll give you the money up front. And, uh, and breed the mare in the spring. So I bought Valerie then uh, after the first of the year, and uh, I said, uh, well, why don't you just breed her to uh, give him the money, and I think I paid $2,500 for her. And uh, I said, I'll pay the money, can you breed her to Shamrock King? 
yeah, I'll keep her and breed her Shamrock King. So that's how she got pregnant <coughs> with Sky King. So she was up there and she was in foal. And uh, Chuck Porter, Gary's father, had a mare up to uh, Lee's getting bred. And uh, he said, well, bring my bear. In the spring after both in foal, he says, you bring my bear home too and, and with yours. Well, we had this covered wagon for a trailer. It was a U-Haul trailer with a canvas top, two-wheel, two-haul trailer, pulling behind a car. And I went up and got my mares, that much, uh, uh, Chuck's mare and my mare, and we got around Kalamazoo, Michigan, and that trailer come unhitched with a from my car. And that's just a little two-wheel trailer, two brood mares in the back, and I looked to the rear view mirror, and here's this trailer going in over end on this interstate, literally end over end. I got stopped right away and ran back and ripped over the back door, which is two wing nuts, <laughs> and uh, pulled those two mares. I drug them out of the trailer. I don't know how I did that. They just laying on top of each other. Laid out, tied them up to the cyclone fence. They both walked, walked away. They was kind of burgered up a little bit. And of course, traffic has stopped everywhere. Truckers stopped and the trailer was just demolished. And uh, the highway patrol there said, I'll get you a place to put them and all this, that. And, so I called Chuck up and Chuck said, you come to my house, <clears throat> when you get to my house, <clears throat> go up the stairs to this certain bedroom and you and Sandy go to sleep and the next morning take my <clears throat> truck and trailer up there and get the ponies and that's what we did. And that mare, Valerie, was carrying Sky King at the time. She was pregnant with Sky King. Um, we were showing when, when Rich Campbell was training for us, we went to Devon three years in a row and I had uh, you know, Dawn that works for us, she was doing chores for me. And they're out at Devon and everything's going good. As long as I could keep Rich from getting caught shooting fireworks, why well, we was doing all right. And uh, uh, <laughs> that's another story. But anyway, um, uh, she called me up and says, uh, bad news. She says, oh, I had, uh, I better preface this, we had three really good two really good uh, winglings, yearlings that year, coming yearlings, it'd be yearlings in the spring, and a two-year-old. And I just bought my new place, I just had new fences, and I had these paddocks, about four acres paddocks, and uh, Rich told me, don't, I always turn my yearlings out in the timber pasture, he said, don't turn those two ponies out in the timber pasture, they'll break a leg, they'll do something, and I said, oh, and he finally talked me in, so I put them in there, and they were in there for a month. High tech, head of class, and, uh, Code of Honor. So Don calls me uh, while we're at Devon and says, one of them has shattered its leg. It's a diamond mesh fence, all new, grass to knee high, nothing in there to hurt it, but two other studs, a yearling and a two-year-old. I don't know which one got it. And, uh, but anyway, I said, well, we gotta save it. Because it had the genetics that I was after so strongly, this horse did. So anyway, uh, my brother and Julie, and I don't know whether Shay or Shayla went with him, but anyway, they, I said, you gotta get it up there. So the veterinary came out, they kind of tranquilized the mare and put bales of hay in this trailer and, and got her in there and, and they, they uh, bandaged it up best spots because bones were showing and everything. And uh, they got it to Iowa State at midnight and before midnight. And uh, so I, Called the next day, I said, at Iowa State University, I said, How, how's this pony doing? Well, we haven't got a chance to look at it yet. This pony had bones showing and dirt in there. They cleaned up the best they could and then looked at it. At the end of the day, they still had not looked at this horse. And that really bothered me. And he said, well, we'll get looking at it. We'll do it. So next day, I uh, call him and talk to him about it. And he said, well, I don't think we can save it. He says, uh, you might have to put him down. I said, no, you're not going to put this horse down. You're going to save this horse. And uh, so he said, well, keep trying. And of course, he had this leg in a cast with the other leg, the good leg, on the other side as a yearling. And that was, it went on and off that way, trying to save that leg the rest of that summer. And in August, towards the end of August that year, that veterinary, head veterinary at the Iowa State University, called me and said, you got to put this horse to sleep. I said, no, we can't. I said, I've been checking. You can put a prosthesis, prosthesis on this pony. Oh, you don't want to do it. It's just a pony. I said, this pony is worth over $100,000 to me right now. 
I got to keep him as a breeding horse because the bandolier's already gone. He's, he's already passed on. So he started swearing at me over the phone. This is a head guy at a quine hospital there at Iowa State University. So I'm sitting in the barn there at the office, and, or sometimes we call it kitchen. I don't know what we call it. Tom knows what it is. And uh, I sit there five minutes, and I was kind of getting upset. So I called the university, and I said, I want to talk to the, uh, I called the university, I said, I want to talk to the, the administrations ahead of the equine hospital. Okay. He said, what's your problem? I said, I told him about this hackney pony and what all happened. And a guy wants to put it to sleep, put it down. And uh, I said, I won't let him do it. And he won't put a prosthesis on. He said, it costs too much, it's not worth it. I said, I want to tell you something. That's the exact words I said. I know Senator Grassley, you've probably seen him on the TV, uh, Iowa Senator Grassley, and Tom Vilsack, which is Secretary of Agriculture for a long time, he's from my hometown, I said, I know two of these guys. I'm going to expose this university coast to coast, border to border, if it costs me over $100,000 if you don't do what I tell you to do. He says, you let me get back to you. So a few days later, another veterinary calls me, he says, I'm the new uh, equine vet up here, uh, what do you want to do with this pony? I said, I want you to put a prosthesis on. He says, we can do that. So if we'd have done it at the beginning, the other leg wouldn't have went bad. And they said, if you get two years out of him, feel lucky. I got 11 years out of him. I changed that leg every day and put a new socks on, new bennings underneath. But eventually the other leg, which bore all that weight during this time, plus he had to bear, bear with the prosthesis. But my friend from Ireland, Paul Trimble. Paul Trimble from Ireland, he took that picture outside the barn, and I thought, well, that isn't too bad of a picture of that horse. But that was, that was coat of honor right there. Okay. Um, Master Craft Peggy, I'll do quickly. The Country Boys, you know, remember anybody remember the Country Boys? Yeah. In Muncie, Indiana. We were just getting started, and they had Inquisitive on the sale, and uh, I wanted to buy Inquisitive because of Fleetwood's Drive. Couldn't do it. Went for too much money. In fact, one of the country boys bought him back and sent him to Doc Ron and Brandon Master Supreme again. But I bought a, a King of the Plain, line bred King of the Plain mare, Mastercraft Peggy. So Sandy and I, you know, when we got started, nobody knew us and no one cared to know us. <laughs> and, uh, and so I thought, well, I can get somebody to haul it back to Iowa. There's people out there going, you know, going back and forth. Not one soul would even act like they wanted to help me get it back home. But John Pestley's wife, his first wife, I don't know, uh, what's her name? What is it? Huh? No, that's a daughter. Joyce, 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 Joyce Peffley. She says, you know, I was in that situation once. Joyce is the only one that helped me. She says, get a U-Haul trailer, and you can prop the door open in the back, the two before or something, give it some air, and you can take your mare and cold home. Match crash Peg Peggy had a full on her side by Marapolo's Magic Fling. So we head home on late Saturday night. Oh, by the way, while we was there, the night before, they had a big party at the hotel and everything. And, and uh, so the next day, they said, uh, somebody said to Sandy and I, where'd you, where, where'd you stay last night? What motel do you use? I said, oh, we stayed back. Oh, there somewhere. It was in our car where we stayed. <laughs> it's like we couldn't afford a motel because the mayor cost me $200, $400, and that was enough. So anyway, we got on the way home, middle of the morning, and uh, Barron went out on this U-Haul trailer, and lucky we gave him the gas station. Back then they had gas stations, they had mechanics, and, and uh, he said, I know that that's a Chrysler bearing. He said, I can get, I'll call the Chrysler guy, and he'll bring a bearing over, and he fixed me up. We got home uh, Sunday morning with Mastercraft Peggy. So we've had a lot of experiences like that because we wasn't able to afford to do much, but we were going to get involved with Hackney Ponies one way or another. And then uh, we showed a lot of hands, Sandy, that I did, because uh, it's easy. That's where we need to get more people showing in hand because that gets them started. New people need to start in hand. So we were showing, and I don't know what pony it was. Do you remember? But anyway, uh, we won the class, and it was going out after we got a ribbon on, going out, and he's announcing, and this pony was getting away from me. And I kept saying, slow, slow, slow. And she thought, she, she kept whipping the pony, whipping the pony. And I said, slow, and she whipped it again. And, and I, I went to the bar and I said, why did you do that? I said, slow. And you said, I thought you said go. <laughs> 
So that time, we figured that's the time we better quit showing hand ponies. And uh, Jay and I had talked a little bit about a trip to England. And uh, so uh, I want to talk a little bit here briefly about the Ohio Pony Farm. This is an amazing story. If you ever have a chance to read this book, Lyle Hartman wrote this book because Washington, uh, historical Washington County or Washington, uh, one uh, uh, story about the Ohio Pony Farm. And it goes back, it's really interesting, it goes back to uh, uh, the older man, uh, George Heil. He was a founder of the Pony Farm, and uh, he uh, raised purchin, purebred Persian horses. He, liked, he raised a lot of purebred animals, hogs, chickens, sheep, and Persian horses. So he went to uh, Janesville, Wisconsin to buy some Persian horses, and uh, the, when he bought the horses he wanted to buy, the guy up there told him, you have, to, you have to take 10 ponies, 10 Shetland ponies, if you're going to buy these horses. And he was reluctant to do that, but he took these 10 ponies. He took them home, and he, got so, he sold the ponies higher than he could sell the Percheron horses. And so uh, he went into, uh, uh, then there's, uh, that was George, uh, George Heil, uh, Harley's father, and uh, so they imported, uh, Harley Hyland imported, uh, I think he says he imported uh, 24 head of Hackney ponies from England, France, and Holland. And that was, uh, when I was talking to Tom, it's re we're real fortunate to have people in those early years that had the foresight to import really good stock to America, because we couldn't develop the Hackney ponies if we didn't have these European ponies. Uh, Ironically, one of the ships that brought the ponies over on the way back to England uh, went down and, and sunk in the ocean, but it was empty. And then Heil told, or Lyle, Lyle Hartman told, he, he's a very humble man, he never wants to mention his name, but he, some of the stuff he told me personally. Uh, they didn't show during the war, during like 1945, 46, they, they stopped showing. They had several dispersals, and then they got back into it. and. Uh, they uh, went and they sold a pair of Hackney ponies out east and they had to deliver them out there on the train. But in order to sell the Hackney pony mare, the Hackney ponies in, in pairs was a big thing back in those days. That was, seemed to me bigger than singles. And uh, so in order to, uh, to sell those pair of Hackney ponies that they imported, he had to take a brood mare in on trade. So uh, they rode by train in those days and uh, Lyle was in the car with that brood mare, and she foaled. On 19, in 1939, the year I was born, uh, that mare foaled, and uh, Iona Hyle always registered or named all the ponies, kind of like Sandy names them at our place, and uh, she named that pony Creation King. He took the mare on trade, didn't really want it, but he had to do it to sell the pair, and the mare foaled on a, on a box car coming back, to uh, Peoria, Illinois area, and uh, that was Creation King. They uh, showed Creation King at the Waterloo Dairy Cattle Congress and won a grand champion uh, uh, stallion there and, and harness and everything. But the thing I'll kind of conclude with is <clears throat> they showed at World Fairs, Ohio Pony Farm showed at World Fairs, they showed at San Francisco and then shipped to Madison Square Garden in nine days by train, they went from San Francisco to Madison Square Gardens to show. Lyle also told me lots of times they went to a show and the train would be late. And one time it was so late that uh, they had to harness the ponies in the boxcar, drive them down the chute, and drive them right into the show ring. So those are the days, the good old days, I guess. Now, do we have any questions, comments, or anything today? I tried to rush through this. I there's, to cover everything, it'd take, it'd take many, time, many days to really cover everything, but it gives you a thumbnail, a little bit about my experiences and what I look for in ponies and stuff. So, any comments? Did I make mistakes or tell something wrong, which I could have? I don't know. <laughs> Tried not to. Yeah, Steve. Right. That's right. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's definitely, that's true, and it, I think Secretary was one of them. Um, equality is another one that on our farm, his daughters and his sons outproduce him, mostly. Uh, more than not, not, they outproduce him. I got daughters of uh, equality that's really producing, and, uh, you know, raining fires and the sun. I got another young son uh, uh, that's got humdinger line that I'm using. Um, that uh, and, and that's definitely true. And and the old timers, uh, I always heard that the old English people would say, in the Hackney business, <coughs> breed the dam back into the sire. Bring the dam's breeding back into the sire's breeding. Does that make sense? Um, get, throw something up there, Jay. If you got any any bloodline. All right, handsome. Oh yeah, handsome Harry is our featured stallion. Is in other words, if you want to breed handsome Harry to something. Find something good in here and put it back into Handsome Harry. Mainly on the dam side. I should say that, the dam side. All right, a King's Brass, which is by, you could take a High Flyer mare, if there's any of those left. <coughs> yeah, there's Gentleman Jim, that's Dutch white breeding. There's Souvenirs Candlelight, that's Dutch white breeding. Uh, there's Dutch white breeding in Bandelier. And there's Humdinger here. So I'd say if you could, especially if you could get some of that type of breed and throw it back into Handsome Harry, if it's a decent individual, again, if it has good characteristics about it. And up here, um, that's Heartland Bell, which is by Bandelier. I don't know, you can't, you can't put too much Bandelier on top of Bandelier unless it's out of athletic Bandelier mares. Bandelier was not a real athletic animal, as you know. He's more of a leg trotting animal. So that's the reason we always had to line breed the Humdinger line or Shamrock King into the Bandelier line to get an athletic line that still had carriage. Because Bandelier, what he'd always do is help with carriage. But you had to come on this side to get your athletic ability and it can't just come with one line, it need to come as much as possible the whole damn line, like he was saying. Does that make sense? Right. He emphasized that time yep. and time and time again. Yep. We always want to talk about the sire of the individual, but he said when you're looking for top breeding stallion, make sure the dam of that stallion is really. That's exactly dynamic. right. That's exactly right. Um, don't overlook the damn side. It was, at different times, people call me up and uh, want to know, give my recommendation on how to breed a mare. And I say, well, how's it bred? Well, it's by this stud. I said, what's a dam? I don't know. Well, they shouldn't be in the breeding business. They don't know the bloodlines. Yeah, that's true. Somebody else? Matt, you got something to say, don't you? I just got here. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Yep. But I can remember when John Shea brought him up to the Illinois State Fair just to work him. He wasn't showing him. He was only two or three years old. And because he and Joe had grown up kind of close together and stuff, he said, Mom, I'm going to work this three-year-old. And we took him over there in bar 13. And he worked this pony, and the pony was beautiful, and he couldn't crown over corn top. Yep. And he said, you know, I think this is going to be a really nice pony. We're like, yeah, you surely ought to know better than this. And by the time he was Wait. four or five, he yeah. Yeah, that's a good point you brought up. Not all of them are going to trot right off the bat. Uh, at our farm, I, I was able to buy uh, Macmillan back. See, I, uh, when they were kind of cutting back and their health wasn't so good, and, and Jay said, that's when we showed uh, Summer Rain and Heartbreaker at Louisville. And Jay said, why don't you go to Ed and Gene Wilson and see if they'll sell Macmillan? I said, oh, they won't sell him. They said, well, it doesn't hurt to ask. And so I asked him, I said, yeah, we might. So a month later, I, I got him bought, and um, uh, Macmillan's, when we bring him in the barn, and different people's told me, I know Rich says, they not, might not fit into your program, because you, you always got to have three-year-olds out there that's 
really doing their stuff. And I thought, oh, surely we will. But we bring these McMillans in, and Tom, you was out there this fall. You ought to see a couple of them now. It's unbelievable. They didn't have much motion. I said, what did I do by this horse and breed to some of my best mares? And they don't trot. But that your point is well taken. That exactly, it takes some time. And they have plenty of motion. Plenty of motion. There's one out of Rain Song, and I can't, he's got too much motion. I don't know whether he's going to be able to put himself together. Yeah. Yeah, Rhythm Spirit, the Rhythm Spirit, that, uh, uh, Rex Parkin surely uh, had uh, Rhythm Spirit. I had a lot of respect for Rhythm Spirit. Oh, man, I remember years ago being down at Kennedy Pony Farm and Mark's Rhythm Time. Anybody ever see Mark's Rhythm Time? Beautiful little pony, gorgeous little pony. And they never did much with him because he wasn't creation king and he used, didn't use him a whole lot. And uh, I wish I could have had him. He's by Mark Time and by Little Bubbles, a beautiful pony, out of the Dunhaven. That was a Dutch white mare right there. That was a Dutch white mare. Yep. Beulah Jean was really, that was one of the best road ponies, I, I thought. Beulah Jean. Yep. Rhythm Spirit's good on the dam side of a lot of ponies. Okay, anybody else? Yeah. Awesome creation, you mean awesome creation himself? Yeah. yeah. Awesome creation, we got this pony from Lee Dunn. Well, that's a long story. <coughs> Lee's a good friend of mine, and uh, we talked a lot, but I, different ponies he'd have, and I'd like to get a hold of, I'd, I'd say, you ever decide to sell it, you let me know. You know, I, you know I'll get the money, I'll borrow the money or something, I'll get it. And that one was uh, awesome creation. And we had it bought. I, uh, is one year is three hundred thousand. Next year is two hundred fifty thousand. But anyway, Mrs. Pretzoff and I went together on a couple studs, and one was this one. And we had him bought one year, and then Lee called me and said, "I decided not to go sell him because he was always going to uh, buy a farm, another farm, and that." So anyway, that's uh, okay. So the next year he said, "I'll sell that horse," and he's nine years old. And uh, I called Miss Pretzel, you still want to go half? Yep, I want to go half. I said, uh, okay. Um, she said, fly up there and get it bought right away for he changed his mind. And uh, so I checked the airlines and it was, I could drive up there about as fast as flying up there and I'd have a car. So I took Mike Dumas with me. He was training for me at the time. And we went up there and, and I, I had the check made out and uh, and went there and talked with him a while. And Bev was about in tears. And, and I said, well, let's load him up because it's starting to rain and I it's in the wintertime. Is it around, right up first of the year. And, and uh, I went to get home and we was loading him up and, and he said, I don't know. I, maybe we better not sell him. And I just, Dumas and I, we just kept loading him up. We just kept loading him up. We shot the, shut the trailer door and I said, we got to get going. The weather's not good. And uh, so we took that pony and I sent him to Mike's. He was at uh, Prince Yoder's place. I sent him there to get trained and he'd just been in tack up there at Leeds. I don't, he'd never been in the shafts or anything. And uh, so Mike did a really great job with him. He had so much talent. Unbelievable, I should have brought pictures of him. Unbelievable motion front and back. And uh, so he took him in nine, eight or nine months, he won the stallion gilding class at Illinois State Fair and at Louisville. And then uh, we, he didn't win a stake. I think he was second a stake. And then we uh, got him for breeding then. And then he, he got, uh, uh, Rodney got a brain tumor and Cushing disease. And he colicked all at once. And what I was saying is his daughters have gone out yep, some yep. of the best Well, modern. you can see why. I mean, look at that bloodline. Cadet Commander through Mastercraft Cadet out of a King of the Plains mare, Yankee Doodle by Questionnaire by King of the Plains, uh, Dixfield Starlet, I forget the sire there, and then you got your Stone Age Jupiter right here, and Lockburn Bell, this is, that was a good mare right there. 
That's really, really good button. Then you go down here to Royal Matter Melody. That was a great producing mare. I wrote an article about her. She had many, many good ponies. And Doc Ron had, somebody bred her to Reed Ann's Hot Potato. I don't know if you remember Hot Potato. He was a hot pony by Master Supreme and out of a double king mare, really hot poto, uh, pony. And, and, and Yankee Doodle Melody by Yankee Doodle's Bible stock, private stock is by Yankee Doodle by King of the Plains and Little Judy's by King of the Plains, King of Bennett by King of the Plains and I don't know what that mare is by without looking it up. So it's just, you can't, when you get that type of line breathing, how can they help from not being good? There can be a dud, but it's not likely. That's my opinion. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. If I was 40 years younger, maybe 30 years old, where, what, what three mayor bloodline would you tell me about to be successful in that? It's too late for me to do that. I'm second. You mean it's out there now? Uh, yeah, yeah. It's, if I was 30 years old, I would go by three mayor. What bloodline would you tell me about? What I would buy is, and I'm, I hope I don't sound, no. I'm tooting my own horn, but I'd buy something with Humdinger in it, Shamrock King in it, and Bandelier in it. Or the families of those families. Because every pony in the show ring practically today has got Bandelier in it somewhere. You got carriage in there. Uh, we just lost uh, Artland Stylish Stepper, the sire of Andy's long tail. It colicked really bad. Uh, this year and lost him and he was out of a full sister to Rain Song which is Sky King out of Emotion out of Emotion's daughter wasn't it? New Song yeah Emotion's daughter New Song so that's what I would do I mean it works for me it, I mean I'm uh, I wish I was 30 years younger to because I like to do be able to do more uh, I mean I mean, I'll be 78 next month, and so I know people don't live much past 100, so. <laughs> but I'm going to stay with it as long as I can. Okay, anything else? How are we for time, Tom? Still good? Any other comments? Any, any, any things you've experienced that has worked for you? Yeah. Yeah. He yeah. He was. He yep. Cadets was. That's right. Emotion. But look how he's bred, though. Yeah. Steady bloodlines. I tell you, another thing I encourage anybody who's on the Hackney board, for me as a breeder, I need a Hackney stud book. A book that I can steady and open. I can see what other people are breeding. That's what I did for years and years and years. I studied stud. I could almost quote a partic any particular stud book. You give me a name, I can tell you the bloodlines. I can't do that anymore because I don't study it anymore like I used to. But uh, stud books are so important to find out what's out there. What's, the, what's, America, what's Americans and Canadians breeding? What kind of ponies are they breeding? And you see a bloodline. I like that t t particular bloodline. That could maybe enhance what I'm doing if I could get it. But now you get, the only thing you do is look on the computer and I don't even know how to turn a computer on. And uh, yeah. so I had lost. I need a stud book. We used to have one every other year. And uh, so uh, online is not always accurate. That stuff on, uh, for example, Yankee Doodle's Melody, the last colt she had before she broke her leg was strutting stuff. It's not in, the, you look at it on your computer, it's not there. Okay, what else? Right. I, I read an a extensive article that Doc Ron gave me, and he got it from some researcher on racing quarter horses. And uh, he stated that he found out, all right, on racing horses, you can determine which are the good ones by a clock, right? So you know which ones can run fast and all that. He said, now, if you, uh, you take uh, 
uh, don't have any line breeding, just good animals, your chances of getting a better offspring than the parents is not very good. But if you have a line bred uh, sire or dam and uh, another outcross that's just a plain outcross, no line breeding there, you increase your chances of getting a racehorse pretty good. But if you take a line bred stud up here and breed that's got those fast times, line bred stud to get those fast times, breed it to a different line bred dam with, that, with fast times, completely different, he says your percentage is increased tremendously. Tremendously. Line breeding works. They knew it back in the early 1900s. At least they either knew it or they didn't have any other studs to breed to. It's in the pedigree. <laughs> Fair showed as a, yep. either a three-year-old or a two, uh, two-year-old, two two-year-old. As a two-year-old. And we're there with our saddle horses and, and all of a sudden this, this pony's walking higher than our horses could try. And that was the most impressive, I mean, obviously he's an impressive pony, but, but that stuck with me as far as the impressiveness of ponies and, and gave me a, I guess, a desire to, to want to experiment with ponies, but um, but just envisioning watching a pony like that or these high-headed ponies trotting it, that really kind of brought me around to, to today, which now I've got five of them, so. <coughs> That's a point I made a number of years ago. We need to expose the public on the Hackney Pony. I don't know, I, I, <clears throat> I love saddlebreds and everything, but there's nothing like a powerful, dynamic Hackney Pony to set behind. There's just nothing like it. And I can tell you about a story about equality. The smartest pony I've ever seen. He was so smart, he would always get by with things. I was clipping him at Louisville, uh, three-year-old year, in a stall, and I had the cross ties in the corner of the stall, and I had my clipper with a cable, you know, and I was trying to trim him up, and he reached over and turned the knob of the clipper off. I turned it back on, he turned it off. Did it about six, eight times. And uh, he's always figuring something out. And I, well, he used to be in our arena barn, Tom, where they had stalls in there at the other, other side. And when we'd be training uh, ponies there, why, uh, do you see, might have been Dumas. I don't know if it's after him. But anyway, we'd shake a jug with rocks to get a pony going around in a circle. And that pony had to have something in his stall to play with, so we put a milk jug in his stall and he'd play with it. But every time, this happened every day for a solid month and he quit. He would take that jug and rake it across the grit of the stall. Whenever we would shake the jug, he would do that. We'd stop the jug and he, he would put it down. We'd pick it up, he'd pick it up and rake it again. Just, I can tell stories after stories, the sparse boy. He was so smart, when he was home, we wondered if he'd ever make a show horse in the ring. Because at home, he said, I know what to do. Why do I have to do this? Why do you have to get me aired up? And it, it uh, worried Rich a lot, because at home, it, you could air him up at home if you really went after him, but we didn't want to do that all the time. But every time he hit the, hit the show ring, he was a different pony. People drove from states away, we had all kinds of letters. People drove from five states away just to see him show at Louisville. And I, he was just another pony, but he, he did show golf in the ring pretty good. And the best show he ever had was at the, at the uh, he seemed to know about the crowd, at the Tennessee Walking Horse Celebration. Went down there, there 35,000 people in that arena, and it just lit him up. That was the best show he ever had. He didn't, didn't beat anybody. <laughs> yep. Okay, that it? Okay, I, uh, if ever I get tired and want to talk about ponies, just come to our farm. And uh, I get talking too much about them, but I, that, the pony, Hackney ponies really excite me, and they always have. And I hope uh, other people get excited too. <laughs>